This week on Next, we're going to do something a little different. We'll spend the entire episode digging into one issue, housing. We're going to look at affordable housing in Vermont. There is a joke that all the housing in Vermont is affordable if you were someone who was super rich. Gentrification in Boston. When you first moved here, did you worry that you were a gentrifier? (laughs) Every day. (laughs) I don't just worry about it. I know that I am. But, you know, the way I think about it, there is not really anywhere you can move to where you're not going to be having that effect. And homelessness in Maine. I think one of the biggest myths that we see is people think it's just runaways who don't want to live under their parents' roofs with their parents' rules, and that's just clearly not what we saw. From the New England News Collaborative, it's next. Next is produced at Connecticut Public Radio and is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm John Dankosky. Thanks for joining us. We're going to dig into one issue this week, housing in New England. It's not a surprise that our housing costs are some of the highest in the nation, but there are a lot of other factors making this issue one of our region's most pressing. Electricity, heat, food and transportation all cost more here. Our bustling urban hubs are attracting high-tech jobs and sky-high rents that are forcing lower-income workers out of the cities. But the availability of affordable housing in the suburbs can be a challenge, too. And in New England's rural regions, many of our existing houses are old and inefficient, far from shopping centers and public transit. So today we're going to explore these problems and some solutions, and we're going to start in Boston. About five years ago, the city was looking at ways to make housing more affordable. The median rent price for a one-bedroom apartment is about $2,400, well out of range for most middle-income workers. So Boston set out with a plan, build more housing. The goal was 69,000 new units of housing by 2030, with 16,000 set aside for low- and middle-income Bostonians. But even as new apartments come on the market, longtime residents are being pushed out by the forces of gentrification in neighborhoods like Eggleston Square in Jamaica Plain. Back in January 2017, we talked about this with Luis Coto, who was at the time a community organizer in that neighborhood. You know, gentrification, everyone, everyone has their own definition, but uh, it's the changing of a neighborhood and mostly caused by an influx of more affluent population and and normally you'll see this in big cities. It equates to displacement of a poorer of color population. And and what we see, what what we're seeing in Eggleston is, you know, the consequence of that is is higher rent prices, which um, has be, have become astronomical. So what you'll see, the primary architectural style in Eggleston and most of Boston is the triple decker, and uh, you'll have a triple decker that has two bedrooms on the first floor three bedrooms, three bedrooms, and those used to be family apartments. Mm. And what you see now is that, you know, you have a three-bedroom, they'll go for upwards of a 2400 because you'll get three working adults because that's the only way they'll be able to afford that. Um, but if you think of that density in the neighborhood that's built a lot of triple-deckers, you know, in a city that doesn't do parking bans in the winter... Mm-hmm. You know, how many, you went from three families, possibly two cars, to eight adults, possibly four cars, three cars, in this, you know, very concentrated neighborhood. And that density and the the traffic and the parking, everything that goes with that is severely affected. That's Luis Coto from our conversation about Eggleston Square two years ago. WBUR's Kanat Khan takes us back to that neighborhood to see how it's changing. Alex Ponte Capellan grew up in Lower Roxbury near Eggleston Square in the 90s and early 2000s. I would hang out here like summer times, especially as a, as a Latino youth. Most of my friends were in JP. He's watching the square change, with new construction going up on Washington Street, the main drag of Dominican restaurants, barbershops, beauty salons, and auto body shops. And it's changing in other ways, too. Eggleston has long been a multiracial working class neighborhood. In 2010, the census tract encompassing most of the square switched from majority minority to majority white. The median household income increased. In 2000, it was just under $40,000. Now it's almost $70,000. 
a third of households have incomes over $100,000. The first big sign that there was change in JP was when the high-low supermarket became Whole Foods. And that was like, kind of like a market signal, like, hey guys, the coast is clear, come on down. To explain some of what's happening, we have to back up to the 1930s. Eggleston was once a redlined neighborhood. It was deemed a risky investment because immigrants and people of color lived there. So for decades, the federal government didn't underwrite home mortgages and loans there. It led to a self-fulfilling prophecy of distressed properties and blight. In 1960, two out of every five housing units were considered deteriorated or dilapidated. By a cruel irony, the decades of disinvestment in Eggleston have made it a good investment now. Inexpensive buildings are bought and flipped to cater to higher-income residents. And now we're greenlighting development, and we don't care what happens to the residents that live here. Neighborhoods that once had the lowest housing prices have seen them rise at a far greater rate than the rest of the city. For example, the median cost of housing in Roxbury rose 70 percent from 2010 to 2015, compared with the rest of Boston, where the median price of housing rose 36 percent. Ponte Capayan is now a community organizer at City Life Vida Urbana. He's taking me to one of these flipped apartment buildings. So this house, it's, um, it has uh, six apartments. And the landlord came, bought the building, and immediately gave everybody rent increases, which uh, most of the families there couldn't afford. We arrive at a triple-decker which looks recently painted. When it was purchased, the building had significant maintenance issues. A nonprofit had made an informal offer, seeking to fix up the building and keep the tenants housed without significantly raising the rent. But a corporate landlord had the winning bid and made improvements, including a new roof and modern appliances. The tenants had been paying between eight and nine hundred dollars for rent. The company proposed thirteen fifty, although it said the fair market rent was twenty three hundred dollars. A year-long negotiation commenced, after which the company sued. All the tenants eventually agreed to move out. The folks here had been negotiating for so long. I know this company owns a bunch of property. They're developing all over the place. Really, like, a few hundred bucks is that important for you? And because of that, a few families had to deal with displacement. And, and some of these families broke up. My first house is the red one and orange one right there on the corner. And then, well, my first JP house, I should say. Eric Harrett moved to Eggleston Square in 2011. He's a software developer who was drawn to the neighborhood for its proximity to the Orange Line and for its diversity. He's also watching it change. The neighborhood is getting a lot richer and a lot whiter. And to me, that is the kind of neighborhood change that makes me very nervous and afraid. By the time I have kids, there won't be a place like JP for them to live in. When you first moved here, did you worry that you were a gentrifier? (laughs) Every day. (laughs) I don't just worry about it. I know that I am. But, you know, the way I think about it, there is not really anywhere you can move to where you're not going to be having that effect. You know, I think most people will try to live in the neighborhood that meets their housing needs. And, you know, as long as we're not building, you're going to be displacing somebody in that process. Herrett cares about displacement. For him, the only way longtime residents and new higher-income arrivals like himself can both live in JP is if there is more housing. The theory that building new housing will address affordability is called downward filtering, and it's the approach Boston is taking. The assumption is that rents are rising because there's a housing shortage, and that means low-income and high-income households are competing for the same limited housing. Creating new market-rate units meets the demand from high-income households. They'll rent or buy these new apartments, freeing up the older housing stock for lower-income households. But the solution is not so straightforward. You know, it can take quite a while for, for downward filtering to really have an effect on the market. Chris Herbert is the managing director of Harvard's Joint Center on Housing Studies. He says downward filtering can take years. In the meantime, rents rise and plateau at a higher level. The issue becomes how to maintain a neighborhood with a mix of incomes while all of this, gentrification, displacement, downward filtering, 
is unfolding. Income segregation is a powerful force. What you have to do to counter that is to take positive, affirmative steps to create housing that is affordable across the spectrum, that you don't just leave that to the market. Basically, Herbert says, increasing the supply of market rate units alone isn't going to solve the housing crisis. There have to be active efforts to build and preserve affordable housing for a range of incomes. So let's see. As we come around the corner here... That's Eric Herrod again, the software developer. We're in the heart of Eggleston Square, facing a development known as 3200 Washington. It stands out from its neighbors of triple-deckers. It has six stories and takes up the width of a block. Herod supports buildings like this. He's part of a movement called Yimbi, Yes in My Backyard. It promotes higher-density buildings in neighborhoods, especially along transit lines. The real mission of Yimby is to make it so that instead of renovating all of these old, naturally affordable apartments, we have people moving into new buildings like 3200 Washington. Herrett wants policies that would incentivize building new apartments on land that isn't used for housing, such as formerly industrial land. 3200 Washington is also how Alex Pontecapayan, the city life organizer, became involved in housing issues in Jamaica Plain. He was part of a group that protested on the proposed site, demanding more affordable housing. It was back in 2015, when the neighborhood was being rezoned to promote more development. You know, we were out there for a few days in tents, and, like, neighbors would honk their horns as they drove by, brought us coffee and, like, donuts and stuff, hung out with us for a little bit. After more conversations with community groups, the developers of 3200 Washington agreed to build and set aside 18 affordable units, more than the initial proposal. And after years of negotiations over the rezoning, the city agreed to set a goal that 40 percent of new construction be affordable housing. That was Kainat Khan reporting from WBUR. Like greater Boston, housing costs in Connecticut are high. Median apartment prices are about $1,100 a month. But the state also has wide disparities with some of the biggest concentrations of wealth and poverty in the nation. A new report from the Urban League of Southern Connecticut and Quinnipiac University called The State of Urban Connecticut looks at these disparities and what they can tell us about housing here. Robert Brown III is one of the authors. He's a visiting professor of sociology at Quinnipiac. Professor Brown, welcome to Next. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. On this episode of our program, we're we're really focusing in a lot on housing. And so I want to go there with you and talk about uh, what exactly affordable housing means before we get into some of, of what you found about the lack of it. Sure. A, a working definition of affordable housing would be housing that requires that a person or family pay 30 percent or less of their monthly income. And so what we're finding is that particularly for people who live in low-income communities, they may be paying in excess of 50 percent of their income uh, just to live. Uh, one of the other things that we talk about in this report with regard to housing is that in addition to making recommendations about increasing the minimum wage from 10 10 to $15 an hour, which we believe is a good start, a housing wage in this state in particular is really going to be around $25 an hour. And so obviously the ability to make that amount of money per hour goes right back to the issues that we discuss uh, regarding education and then employment um, and opportunities to pay livable wages. So, so talk about that more. The housing wage, what exactly does that calculate? Well, a housing wage calculates, again, the ability of a person or family to meet the rent cost that do not consume more than 30% of their take-home pay. And so what we're finding because of the revitalization of many of the cities in the state, we're finding that rents have skyrocketed, which has displaced a disproportionate number of poor people and certainly people who are coming from communities of color. And in addition to identifying um, avenues to create more affordable housing stock, we also need to make sure that the affordable housing are situated in safe communities. So it isn't just about uh, making enough to... Um, provide a housing wage, but it's also about identifying and and then deploying uh, those types of housing in spaces that are going to be in safe communities, in communities where there are not food deserts, in communities where the access to transportation is appropriate to meet the needs of the people in those spaces. Of course, the cost of housing isn't just the rent or the mortgage that one pays, but it's the overall 
cost of maintaining that house. And in a region like New England, we have the double whammy of both having to heat during a very cold season and also cool down during a very hot, humid, increasingly summer season. Can you talk about that piece of it and, and how the increased costs of housing and the lack of affordability of housing has to do in part with just where we live? Well, that, that's a part of it, and, and you could certainly make the case uh, scientifically about the, the encroachment of, of global warming. I mean, 30, 40 years ago, it was rare, really, that you had to run your, your air conditionings during the summer months. I mean, you could really just keep your windows open and, and be cool, but now we no longer live in that, in that type of an environment. The, the other thing related to the housing costs, we have to talk about the cost for food, the cost for transportation, the cost for child care, uh, the cost for health care, health care if you can afford those things. So in addition to housing costs, we have to set aside monies for those other expenses. But the problem is, and this is where a lot of people, particularly, again, those who are in the urban centers of the state, have to make some very, very difficult decisions. In other words, do I try to meet the rent costs for this month Um, at the expense of perhaps not paying my electric bill, at the expense of perhaps not being able to feed my, my family uh, appropriately. And so these are decisions that growing numbers of people are having to make. And, and it isn't just those who are, for example, living in uh, the urban centers uh, who perhaps may have low levels of education, but it's now we're finding spreading to those who may in fact be credentialed, who may have college degrees, but who may not have been able to find commensurate work. And so the idea of affordable housing should not be thought of exclusively um, to be focused on those who are low-wage earners, but also those who may, in fact, have skills and credentials and perhaps even decades of experience who simply have not been able to find work that is commensurate with their skills or training and then also that pays livable wages. Your report focuses on, on urban centers, and for good reason, but one of the issues in states like Connecticut where you have these many small towns, municipalities spread out, uh, across the landscape, you you have people who sometimes live one place and work in another. You've addressed transportation as being a big problem, but but what about the availability of affordable housing in some of the smaller communities that are outside the major cities? Uh, is that a big problem in the state? Well, it is a growing problem, to be sure. We find that the concentration of the lack of affordable housing is nested within the cities because, again, of revitalization. And so we have this encroachment, if you will, of not just the lack of affordable housing, but you also have increases in populations of people, sometimes younger, who are able to afford much higher rents. And so as a result, this causes a social dislocation of persons who may have been in the urban centers for years or even decades or generations. When we look at what is happening in the outlying areas, the extent of the dislocation is not nearly as high. Um, even though it is become more of a, more and more of, a, of an issue, we find that it is most acute in the urban centers of the state. In your mind, what's a way to address the problem of a lack of affordable housing in the state, aside from what we've talked about already with arming people with a a, a more standard housing wage? Is is there something that we need to do in terms of just building more housing so that the inventory is there for people to 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 use? Well, I I think we have to make a commitment to assign percentages of new housing stock and existing housing stock to people who are coming from low-income communities. I I think that we have to, um, in addition to charging the the higher rents, that has certainly been the case over the last several years in many of the cities of the state, we also have to ensure that we are providing appropriate numbers of housing and houses for people who simply cannot afford to pay, not because of an unwillingness, but because they may only be able to get access to jobs that pay pay very, very low wages. And when I say low wage, I'm talking about those jobs that pay $15 or, or less an hour. And again, that's a, that's a policy decision. Uh, that's something that we need to take um, to, the, to the local, state, and, and, and then the, the higher levels of government um, because this has really become a crisis, not just within uh, the state of Connecticut, but it's become a crisis around this country. Robert Brown III is a visiting professor of sociology at Quinnipiac University and co-author of the State of Urban Connecticut Report. Professor Brown, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. 
By the way, the median rent in New Hampshire is about $1,100 a month. In Vermont, it's $945. In Maine, it's $808. But even in states that are a bit more affordable, it's really hard to find an apartment in the areas that are closest to the good-paying jobs. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate change and global warming. Support also comes from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York. Why is there such a housing crunch in Vermont? That's Peter Curson. He asked that question of Vermont's people-powered podcast, Brave Little State. Peter and his family are looking for a house in Vermont, but they're having a lot of trouble. How's it go on the market? And then they're gone within a week. And then there's a lot of really old properties that are subpar in a lot of ways, and that those are going on the market and getting snatched up anyway. And he's not the only one. Henry App, a reporter and host of All Things Considered for VPR, set out to answer Peter's question. Here's a bit of what he found. To answer Peter's question, we first need to answer a different question. Is there actually a housing crunch in Vermont? To try to figure that out, we spoke with Michael Moser. My name is Michael Moser, and I am the coordinator for the Vermont State Data Center. Moser's been on Brave Little State before. He mostly works with data from the U.S. Census Bureau to get a detailed picture of the people and the economy of Vermont. Okay, there's that. So I brought you, you can have two sets Oh, great. Want, yeah. When we reached out to him for this episode, he very kindly compiled some recent data about Vermont's housing market. The numbers come from two different census surveys, spanning from 2006 to 2017. So, does Moser think Vermont has a housing crunch? Inconclusive. <laughs> I take that back. I, I think that in some parts of the state, there are greater housing pressures than in other parts of the state. Well, let's break that down a bit. First, between the two surveys, the number of housing units in Vermont went up. Yeah, 3.7 percent increase in the total number of housing units uh, between those two time periods. So more housing. Judging by just that number, there's not much of a crunch. But of course, there's more to the story. 26.7 percent of our housing stock is 80 years of age or older. So a quarter of Vermont's housing is old. That's more than double the national average. Our question asker Peter's observation is pretty spot on. Another measure, the vacancy rate. Most vacant houses in Vermont are seasonal and recreational homes, and the vacancy rate is pretty uneven across the state. For example, nearly 47 percent of homes are vacant in Essex County, in the very northeast of the Northeast Kingdom, but just 5 percent are empty in Chittenden County. And this gets to Moser's main point. You're going to feel more of a a housing pressure in a place like Chittenden County than you are in a place like Essex County. And because so many more of us live in Chittenden County, we may perceive that there is this housing challenge across the state of Vermont. Case in point, when we put out a call for stories of people looking for houses and apartments in Vermont, we heard from someone who was having a really positive experience in Rutland County. So maybe this state doesn't have a housing crunch across the board. But talk to housing experts in Vermont and you'll get a different answer. I do think that we have a housing crisis in the state. And so I think that we need all hands on deck. That's Maura Collins. She's the head of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. We finance and promote affordable housing for low- and moderate-income Vermonters. Collins says the so-called housing crunch comes down to one central issue, affordability. There is a joke that all the housing in Vermont is affordable if you were someone who was super rich. Collins says the real crunch is around housing for those who aren't in that upper echelon. Why isn't 
housing affordable for more of us who earn moderate, sometimes even good incomes, and we still can't buy a home and afford our home. One reason for that, Collins says, household incomes in Vermont have been pretty much stagnant for years. They're not moving up as fast or as high as housing prices have. Collins says the rule of thumb in the housing world is if you're paying more than 30 percent of your monthly income on housing costs, your housing is considered unaffordable. You're what's called cost burdened. According to census data compiled by VHFA, 36 percent of all Vermonters are cost burdened. And when you break that down a bit, 30 percent of homeowners and 51 percent of renters are burdened by housing costs. So how can Vermont change that? by building more housing that would be affordable to more people. Collins says new construction is especially needed in some parts of the state, the White River Junction area, Montpelier, Chittenden County. But there are also many communities such as in Rutland and Springfield and a lot of the Northeast Kingdom where the quality of the housing means that it's not fully on the market and we need to rehabilitate those homes to bring them up to energy efficiency standards and other things to make them be homes that people can really afford to live in and not pay too much for the utilities. And there's another divide. In some areas, the need is new construction. In others, it's rehabilitation. But wherever you are in the state, there is still plenty of demand for decent housing. That demand plays out in different ways. In Burlington, Vermont's Queen City, it puts big pressure on the rental market. Marilyn Taglavia knows something about that. Hi. Hi. Are you Marilyn? Yeah, Henry. Henry. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Marilyn and her boyfriend live in the city's old north end on the second floor of a duplex. It was built in 1900, according to city records. It's a nice two-bedroom place, but it has its quirks. When we first moved in here... The pipes broke under the kitchen, and um, all of the water rushed under the stove. Because it sort of slanted down. it's so slanted, yeah. These kinds of oddities Uh, might be familiar to anyone who's rented in one of Burlington's many older properties. And the kitchen's not the only room in Marilyn's apartment with some less-than-ideal qualities. The bathroom is really small, and the bedroom has a slant of its own. I kind of got used to sleeping on a slant here. (laughs) But it's angled Um, down toward your feet. Yes, um, which is interesting. I mean, it's not the biggest deal ever. but Not long after they moved in, Marilyn and her boyfriend knew they wanted to find a better place. So in order to land a new apartment for this coming June, a co-worker of hers recommended they start looking in October. I understand planning in advance, but... The prior year planning is seems a little bit excessive. But their early start paid off. They found their new place just a block away. We yeah, walked over I to mean, see the building. This this apartment is like a dream for us. There's rooftop access, and there is even an elevator inside. And the gray, boxy um, structure was built in 2015. Um, There's parking, better heat, flat floors, all things that Marilyn likes. Now. But it does come at a steeper so. price. Do you mind saying how much it how much it is a month? Yeah, um, I think it's fourteen seventy a month, and right now we're paying thirteen thirty. But totally worth it, she says. Just to note, the median rent in Vermont, according to the latest U.S. Census survey, is nine hundred forty five dollars a month. Burlington's expensive and desirable, according to Sandy Wynn. She's been a realtor in the area since the early 80s. On a snowy February day, she takes me on a sort of real estate tour of the city. Actually, I'm going to continue down here. Okay. Just a bit. And something you should know about Sandy Wynn, she is a major booster of Burlington. Not in any official capacity, but she loves the place. She has something positive to say about pretty much every corner of the city. You know, this is another unique part of Burlington. We're on Riverside Avenue above the Intervale area. We have a wood-burning chip plan. We have a farm. You're in a city. Who does that? Burlington. As we drive, Sandy can't really help but slip into realtor mode. A little ways down Riverside, we turn into a winding drive up to a newer condo development. Have you been up here? No. Uh, Just for the record. No pressure, but there's a market rent unit for sale here for 150000 
At this point in our morning together, Sandy has asked all the right questions to know that I'm a renter. I'm in my late 20s, likely to stay in Vermont for the foreseeable future. Here we go. 155, one bedroom, one bath. Taxes are 3000 Monthly association fee is 283 That's relatively affordable. If you are a young professional and you want to be close to the university, the hospital, I mean... But <clears throat> is that pretty... I mean, at this point... How common is it to find somebody like that? On a regular basis, one or two come up, but you just don't get a lot. For the record, I did not buy that condo. But as of this recording, a sale is pending, according to its online listing. That was an excerpt of a recent episode of VPR's people-powered podcast, Brave Little State. Why does Vermont have such a housing crunch? Big thanks to Angela Evansy, VPR's managing editor for podcasts. Coming up, we'll talk about homelessness in Maine and why it's an issue that especially affects the LGBTQ community. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate and clean energy. Support also comes from the Melville Charitable Trust. Maine is seeing a growing number of young people from preschool through 12th grade who are homeless. They're moving into shelters, they're couch surfing with other families, and in rare cases, camping or living in cars. According to the National Center for Homeless Education, the numbers increased by 30% in just two years. Maine Public's Robbie Feinberg brings us the story behind those numbers and what it's meant for kids and the communities trying to help them. Most afternoons, 18-year-old Michaela, she asks that we not use her last name, sits by herself, hunched over a computer or notepad in a back office at New Beginnings, a shelter in Lewiston for youth who are homeless or displaced. Here, she writes stories and letters to help her process what she's experienced over the past few years. Like, even, like, reading that piece is hard, but it, like, I don't, yeah, it gives me a more positive memory to all of these traumatic events than what I usually would think about. Michaela arrived in Maine about three years ago from Connecticut, where she and her sisters had been raised by their single dad. When he passed away, they moved to Biddeford to be with family. Michaela graduated from high school and even enrolled in community college last fall. But she says without an adult to turn to, she didn't know how to handle financial aid or pay for books. It was really hard to even think about who would I even call, because my family like I said, like being first generation, they wouldn't even really know. So it's like me asking them questions and being like, who do I call? How do I do this? And so like I was literally just living in the dorms, but like not going to classes because I didn't have books and I wasn't doing much of actual school. So I was like, well, I think it's time to just drop out as opposed to paying tuition for nothing. She did drop out. But once she left the dorm, she had few options of where to go. Michaela says she stayed with her grandmother for a bit, but was asked to leave after repeated family conflicts. She says her boyfriend's sister paid for a hotel for a few nights. But without permanent shelter, Michaela and her boyfriend passed the time in 24-hour fast food restaurants just to have a roof over their heads. My friend let me stay in, like, her hallway outside, like, of her actual apartment. Like, we would stay there, or, like, there were other nights where we would just be sitting outside kind of trying to figure something out. Um, Yeah, but it was just months of kind of panicking, and that's really all we could think about. Michaela is one of a growing number of Maine youth identified as homeless or displaced. According to one measure done in 2017, more than 2,500 students were without a safe or permanent place to live. That's a 30% jump from two years prior. The problem is placing pressure on schools and social service agencies across the state, stretching a system that's already seen some cutbacks in recent years. We're not alone in that. It's 
really is a, has been a trend across the country. Gail Erdheim of the Maine Department of Education works with public schools to support students who are homeless or displaced. Erdheim says that it's hard to point to any single factor that's causing youth homelessness to rise. She says it may be partially the result of better reporting and recently reauthorized policies that require schools to put more effort into identifying displaced students. In terms of kind of keying schools into the value of bending over backward to keep kids stable in the school that they've been in, even when they're moving around. But advocates for youth in Maine point to larger societal problems as part of the explanation that's driving the trend. They include a lack of affordable housing, especially in southern Maine. The problem is compounded for the many immigrant families and youth who arrive in Portland shelters, often seeking asylum from violence in their home countries. Susan Wiggin is the transition specialist for Portland Public Schools. So the folks that we see don't have help, don't have caseworkers, don't have jobs, don't have legal standing. They have the clothes that they're wearing, and that's it. And so when um, we have to do a lot of shoring up in our schools from elementary all the way through. In more rural areas, there are other destabilizing factors. Intergenerational poverty, the opioid epidemic, and discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation. Melissa McEntee, the executive director of Rumford Group Homes in Oxford County, says the public may not grasp what's actually happening. I think one of the biggest myths that we see is people think it's just runaways who don't want to live under their parents' roofs with their parents' rules and that's just clearly not what we saw. It was youth that faced a lot of family conflict, youth that were coming from homes where there were major issues with substance use, domestic violence, and youth that were just not able to safely live in their homes. The state has a network of connected shelters and support services to help. And school districts are required to identify homeless students and provide education, transportation, and support under the federal McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act. In Biddeford, officials say the school department has seen its busing costs rise by 40 percent in the past five years. At times, the district has relied on taxis to help get some homeless or displaced students to school. Superintendent Jeremy Ray says there's been an effort to address trauma and hire more social workers in recent years. But the complicated needs pose a challenge. As we look at doing work with students who experience trauma and and all of those pieces, where does it all fit in? How does that flow out and fit into the standards that teachers are requ- are required to teach and that we can actually try to do a good job at everything? And I'm not sure that our setup at, in seven hours <laughs> allows us to do that. For kids who have aged out of the school system, there is a network of shelters that offer support. For 18-year-old Michaela, that support came from the New Beginning Shelter in Lewiston. She says getting counseling and a place to sleep has made a big difference in her life since she arrived about a month ago. She flips through a study book and says she hopes to give community college another try this fall. So I definitely feel a lot better now that I've had, you know, um, somewhere to be where I have resources around me and I've had, you know, time to not have chaos, and be able to figure everything else out that I need to on my own. While Michaela has found help in a city shelter, homeless young people in rural Maine still face separate, persistent challenges on their own, with no easy solutions in sight. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Robbie Feinberg. A disproportionate number of homeless teens identify as LGBTQ. Here's Bianca Wilson. She's co-author of the report, Serving Our Youth. To start, we don't really have um, a great national estimate yet. But, you know, the best estimates that we do have that come from surveys of youth who are experiencing homelessness suggest that approximately 19% of youth um, who are homeless are LGBT. And one city who did a survey actually found as high as 43%. So, you know, compared to, you know, CDC data that we know that shows that only about 10% of the U.S. teen population are sexual minority that suggests that there's definitely overrepresentation of LGBT youth who are homeless. We asked her why the rate of homelessness among this population is so high. One of those reasons, which we did see in our Serving Our Youth survey report, is that staff who worked with youth who are experiencing homelessness felt that family rejection related to the youth sexual orientation and related to gender identity was experienced by 
three quarters of their LGBT clients. And that they saw over 50% of the LGBT youth that they were um, providing services to in these homelessness uh, related services have been forced out of their homes by their parents. So clearly family dynamics, family rejection related to LGBT status is one really significant and problematic factor impacting homelessness. And in rural areas, LGBTQ individuals who are homeless often have even bigger challenges to finding safe spaces. Skylar Wolf is director of the Safe Space Anti-Violence Program for the Pride Center of Vermont. He told us what factors can cause homelessness. Every situation is unique. If you're looking at LGBTQ plus youth, then we're thinking more specifically most of the time about families and the discrimination and the harm that can take place in that immediate household, right? So if somebody doesn't feel safe at home or they're literally kicked out, that's often one route of becoming homeless for LGBTQ plus youth or young adults, underemployed or unemployed young adults in particular. And then when we're thinking about adults more more broadly, we're thinking more about discrimination and some of that internalized harm. So When we think about LGBTQ plus adults that are experiencing homelessness, the people that we work with have often been survivors of sexual or domestic violence, but sometimes it's a little bit messier than that. It's it's not – it doesn't fall into our typical definitions of sexual or domestic violence. Maybe it's just being continually misgendered in a workspace and continually sent down kind of this rabbit hole of – oh my gosh, am I safe to just exist in my physical body on an everyday basis and have a job and show up to work, et cetera. And so we see people who are either fired or who leave their job because they don't feel safe, who have a hard time finding new employment because they've learned slowly but surely that Perhaps they can't trust people. They can't trust employers. They can't trust service providers, et cetera. Um, And so a lot of what we do is we provide that specific LGBTQ plus safe space where people, no pun intended, um, where people can come to us and know that their sexual and gender identities will be respected and affirmed. Um, And uh, the other part of what we do is we do a lot of education work to help make those service providers more inclusive across the state. So, and thankfully in Vermont, um, I'm I'm really thankful to be a part of this state because we have so many people who are eager and just excited to learn how to make more inclusive shelters or um, just in general, in order to help build trust again with these communities that have lost trust in service providers. Hmm. What can you tell us about the the rates of homelessness for uh, people in the LGBTQ plus community that you work with? They're heightened. <laughs> um, frankly, when we think about those rates, it's, it's hard to, for me to talk about just homelessness because all of the experiences of violence are interconnected. Mm-hmm. And it really comes down to that discrimination, right? If you're experiencing discrimination in a household, if you're experiencing discrimination in employment, if you're experiencing discrimination with the safety nets that are supposed to catch you when you're falling through the systems and you're falling into homelessness, people just lose hope. And then that leads to these other issues, whether it's substance use or uh, homelessness or uh, suicidal ideations, etc. They're all kind of interconnected. I'm wondering what added pressures or challenges you face in a state like Vermont that is so rural. Clearly, the area around Burlington is the population center for the state. It's not a large metropolis, but it is a city. But so much of the rest of Vermont is so spread out, and it would be hard, I would think, for for people who are either experiencing homelessness or having a hard time getting to a a steady job to, to grapple with some of these issues when when you have so much space in between. How, how much, Skylar, is that an issue for, for you and your work? Absolutely. Yeah. So the distance, the ruralness is substantial. So in Chittenden County, we have a pretty significant population. I We usually think of Burlington as the largest, smallest city in mm-hmm. a state. Uh, or excuse me, the smallest, largest city. The smallest, largest city. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Um, 
And there's lots of resources here. It, if anything, one of the most difficult things for our team is learning about all the resources and then helping people get connected to those resources um, in ways that are more effective and for the right reasons, the right issues, et cetera. Um, so that we spend a lot of time learning about new resources and we learn about new things like every week. And there are there are just more resources here. So when we when we think about more rural parts of the states, uh, the state, whether we're thinking about well, for example, St. Johnsbury or um, Lamoille, et cetera, Morrisville, um, especially the Northeast Kingdom, there's just less resources. There's just less. Um, and there's there can be these little bright lights of people who are really wanting to make affirming LGBTQ plus spaces in those areas. But there's they, there's only so much that they can do and often – um, it, they also have less funding. So it can be harder to bring us in for a training, for example, because these organizations have less funding for professional development. So we tend to get the most training requests in this area, and then we try to do more of a sliding scale for our charges for trainings so that we can get out to rural areas. But it's hard. You know, somebody in Burlington might be able to pay a few hundred dollars to bring us in for a training, but somebody in the Brattleboro area might be able to only afford maybe a hundred. And when you think about mileage reimbursement and just the the cost of time for staff traveling, the the costs are higher to get to those rural areas for us, and there's also less funding there typically. A last question for you, because we've talked a bit about some of the challenges of for the workplace and in shelters where discrimination can be rampant. What about what about housing discrimination? Famously, Vermont already has a shortage of good, high-quality, affordable long-term housing. So that's a problem for many people seeking uh, housing in Vermont. But I guess I'm wondering if, if the folks that you are working with see that housing discrimination is a big problem in the state. Absolutely. So... With housing discrimination, it when we think about household members in general, there we come back to that conversation about family, and then we also think about roommates, right? And in Vermont, and particularly in the Burlington area, with the costs of housing being so high, most people have to have roommates, which means that as an LGBTQ plus person looking for housing, not only do you have to find a place to stay that is safe for your identities, right? Like looking for a landlord who's accepting and affirming, but you also have to find roommates and often multiple roommates who are going to be respectful and uh, respect your pronouns, et cetera, your partners. And it, it just adds another layer of complexity and nuance. And so often when when we think about discrimination, whether it's with roommates or whether it's with a landlord or if it's with uh, employment, et cetera, it can show up in different ways. It can show up in really overt ways like, nah, I don't like the way that you present yourself or I don't like your partner because of their gender, their sexuality, etc. And it can also show up as, hmm, I'm more comfortable with the person who has the same gender and sexuality as me. I'm more comfortable with the straight cisgender white person um, who is fully able-bodied. And comfort goes a long way when it comes to hiring people or when it comes to putting somebody in housing. Most people want to choose the roommate that they're comfortable with. And often that leads to LGBTQ plus people not being chosen as roommates or as the tenants. Skylar Wolf is the director of the Safe Space Anti-Violence Program for the Pride Center of Vermont. Skylar, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, John, for having me. If you go to our website, nextnewengland.org, you can find links and more information about housing and homelessness in our region. Subscribe for free to our podcast. You can search for Next New England. Next is produced by Lily Tyson. Our digital producer is Carlos Mejia. The executive producer is Katie Tolarski. We had help this week from Peter Engish. Music on the show this week is by Todd Merrill, Goodnight Blue Moon, and Noel Nicarelli. The New England News Collaborative is powered by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Connecticut Public Radio, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, New England Public Radio, WBUR, WSHU, and the Public Radio.